Well, hello, Write the Docs. Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Kathleen Jewell. I am a new cat. Uh, I'm also a member of the developer education team at DigitalOcean. So as some of you may know, in addition to providing cloud infrastructure, DigitalOcean has evolved a body of tutorials, um, over 2,000 to date, on a wide variety of development and open source topics. So I'm part of the team that produces this documentation. Um, and specifically, I work as a technical writer on our public-facing tutorials. However, I've also worked on our team as a technical editor. And in another completely different life, I was trained as an academic and teacher, and I completed my PhD with a focus on popular 19th century American literature and religion. Yes! Oh, man, I was hoping for that. Um, so this talk, of course, for those of you in the room who know popular 19th century literature, this talk has a subtitle. Uh, taken from one of uh, 19th century America's most popular novels, Ten Nights in a Bar Room and What I Saw There, um, just for reference. Uh, <laughs> if there's anyone who wants to talk about temperance reform and religious enthusiasm in, in the 19th century, I'm very much here for it. So just, yeah, just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> In all seriousness, though, I'm using this subtitle because what I have discovered on my journey from one field to another completely different field is a surprising number of commonalities between my former and my present work. Um, additionally, I have the excellent fortune of working with a highly interdisciplinary team of uh, former engineers, academics, teachers of computer science, and professional editors. So the cross-functional conversations that we've been able to have, in addition to my own prior experience, are really the inspiration for this talk. OK, so what is this talk about? And what can you expect to take away from it? My goal today is to turn some attention to the roles that live within technical writing, namely teaching editing, and, of course, writing. Many of us in this room wear all of these hats, often in the space of a given day. But how often do we stop to think about the unique tasks that each of these roles entails, or the hybrid tasks that are the result of where these roles overlap? Things like writing with a specific teaching philosophy in mind, or applying common editorial templates and patterns to our own writing. My argument is that by thinking about these roles and tasks, we can bring greater clarity to our own work. So my goal for the next half hour or so is to unpack a few of the hybrid roles and tasks that have been part of my work at DigitalOcean in the hopes of drawing out some patterns and techniques that can be useful for all of us, hopefully. Things like writing to teach and facilitate understanding, editing with repeatable teaching templates in mind, and editing, applying editorial and teaching practices to the task of writing. OK, so what's the payoff of thinking about all of these things? I would suggest that it's moments like this. Um, moments where users feel empowered by your docs to get the things done that they need to get done. Moments where your docs can really function as working companions to the tasks that your users have on their plates. OK, I want to suggest that we can get to moments like that by teasing apart the different facets of our writing. So in other words, by thinking about how, write, how we write and about how writing is a constant cycle of editing and how editing is a method of teaching and how teaching lives at the heart of any technical document, we can create documentation with the right level of access, clarity, and empowerment 
to best serve our readers and support their goals and ambitions. Okay, so we might all have different ideas about how writing, teaching, and editing function on our individual teams, but what can we learn from best practices and concepts in other closely related fields? Fields like teaching and non-technical editing, for example. So one concept that I would argue that we can borrow from higher education is the statement of teaching philosophy. So this example is from Cornell University's graduate uh, school home resource page for grad students. And they include it there because it's generally required for any academic job application um, and is particularly important for those um, jobs that are teaching focused. So in practical terms, a statement of teaching philosophy is meant to be a one-page document that describes how you teach and, more importantly, why you teach that way. The idea is that your philosophy guides every decision that you make at a curricular level. So how can we turn this idea back on our docs, right? Do we know why we produce our documentation? And furthermore, can we potentially agree that some whys are more compelling than others? Like, for example, we write our docs so that people can make money for their businesses. Might be less compelling than we write our docs so that developers can simplify mundane tasks and spend more time thinking about big picture business logic and the moral and ethical obligations they have um, to their customers. So key questions that we can ask for ourselves are, do we have a teaching philosophy? If we do, is it obvious and visible to our users? So in some cases, your teaching philosophy will be handed to you. Um, it's deeply embedded in the company's objectives, or it's the product of previous conversations and iterations. Um, in other cases, you and your team will need to come up with it. Uh, and think about how and where to make it visible. So in my team's case, our philosophy is inherited from the company's public-facing objectives. To make it simple to launch in the cloud and scale, regardless of your previous um, experience or the size of your operation. So this philosophy inspires conversations on my team around issues like, is the reader getting enough information to feel empowered to do this on their own? Am I making assumptions about what the reader knows and does not know? What can I do to situate the reader in the field and provide them with enough context and explanation so that they don't need to bounce around to a bunch of other docs while working through this one? One place where my team thinks a lot about teaching, and one place that I would argue our philosophy is visible, is in the introductions to our tutorials. Questions that we ask ourselves when writing these introductions include, who do I think the user will be here? What can I expect them to know and not know? What are the key issues and technologies that I should mention to justify this tutorial's existence? So generally speaking, when I approach writing introductions, I think in terms of templates, which is an idea that I'm going to come back to later in this talk. So to make a philosophy of accessibility and empowerment visible, I think about doing the following things. First, I want to define any necessary terms and concepts. Second, I want to try to address the central problem or methodology that the tutorial will cover. And then finally, I want to tell the reader what we're going to make together. So here's how this can look in practice. Um, right, the first paragraph, define. Um, second paragraph, justify. T tell the reader why this matters. And then finally, outline where you're going next with them, what you're going to make. In general, my team takes our teaching philosophy as a prompt to provide context and background. We reason that we, in, if we do this, we can be useful to folks who may be encountering this information for the first time, but also to those who are looking at it as a refresher. More importantly, 
it can potentially help readers extend this information into new and unfamiliar contexts. It can also help keep the reader's experience uh, simple by giving them all of the relevant information that they need in one place so they can get started. Okay, so when a, a clearly defined teaching philosophy works, it's awesome, um, it, it can be really satisfying and make for a great writing experience, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting a couple laughs here. Uh, c complicated subject matter, if any, anybody in the room writing about Kubernetes lately? <laughs> yeah, all right, uh, so, Anyway, at Kubernetes, other complicated subject matter can challenge even the best developed teaching philosophies. So I would argue that this is where you can use another concept from the world of education, woohoo, uh, or rather a methodology, um, in this case called understanding by design. Um, and I know we do have some, anybody familiar with this? Yeah, yeah yes, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, this is a, a methodology that's been popularized in um, K through 12 mainly, but um, some inroads into higher education as well. So this is a picture of the cover of uh, the second edition of the seminal text on this subject, so that's called Understanding by Design. Um, the idea behind this methodology is that students do not learn best, right, when they're expected to memorize content or superficially touch on a wide number of topics. And, you know, if we've gone through an educational system, we probably have experienced some uh, philosophy, <laughs> philosophical approach like this. Um, instead, to quote the authors of this text, Understanding is revealed when students autonomously make sense of and transfer their learning through authentic performance. So one key indicator of understanding, according to this methodology, is the ability to recognize prior learnings in unfamiliar contexts. So how can we think about this in the context of our documentation? For example, what if our docs have a really narrow focus? Or what if we're dealing with really complicated procedural material? Can we really stop to go over big concepts? Do those even belong in every doc? Rather than answering those questions individually, I'd like to talk more broadly about how my team approaches understanding. Instead of a set of prescribed rules, we try to facilitate understanding by using a set of core principles, which we apply each step of the way through writing or editing a doc. The first of these principles is explain general ideas when and where you can. So for example, if you ask readers to copy and paste a Docker file, spend some time explaining how instructions work in a Docker file, in addition to your particular instructions. If you're writing about Kubernetes, which it sounds like some of us are, um, consider talking about object types more broadly, as well as describing the specific object you will create. Second, reference different contexts and scenarios where possible. So to take Kubernetes again as an example, if you're talking about allowing external traffic to a service using a load balancer service type, you could also mention using ingress resources and controllers when working in production. I'd also like to suggest that we can think of failure as a kind of context as well, right? What, what happens if this doesn't work as intended? How can we empower users to debug our docs? Third, gauge your audience. A key part of crafting a successful teaching experience is meeting your students where they are and providing them with what they need to achieve understanding. So there have been some awesome write, um, talks at Write the Docs um, in prior years on researching users and gaining insight into how they experience documentation. Um, whether or not you've conducted that research in a formal way, I would say try to have a clear idea of how and why readers have landed on your doc and how the doc might best facilitate their long-term understanding of that topic. 
finally, and most importantly, tell the user why. What use cases and problems will this doc address? In this way, users can start drawing connections between different problems and approaches using your doc as a jumping off point. OK, so we've, uh, yes, I spent a long time thinking about this visual pun. Um, so we've had, we now have some different ways that we can think about the practice of teaching and writing. Um, but can we also say that editing is a form of teaching? Um, if so, what might that mean? Uh, so I would argue that any editorial program in our field that works with external contributors is thinking about teaching at some level, uh, particularly if they are providing written feedback or guidance on author's work. So at DigitalOcean, we're explicit about the teaching goals of our editorial program. Authors that work with us choose to do so because they want to grow as writers. And you see some nice um, testimonies to this here um, by some writers that have done tremendous work for us. So what can we learn about editing if we approach it as a form of teaching? One way that the uh, editorial team at DigitalOcean facilitates teaching through editing is the use of what I'm going to call templates, which we use at various points in our interactions with authors en route to publication. So these templates are packaged, reproducible suggestions that can be given to authors regardless of the content of their particular tutorial. Some of the key templates that we use in the pre-writing phase have to do with larger level questions, which we often think are easier to answer beforehand rather than um, once the draft is on its way. So one of these questions might be, uh, what is this tutorial about? Why should the reader learn this topic? What will they have built or accomplished by the time they're finished reading? In addition to these pre-writing templates, getting at the, the why of the matter, we also use templates during the writing phase. So for example, we have a template for discussing large code blocks um, and commands. If an author wants to show some code, we suggest doing the following. First, tell the reader what the code will do before you show the code. Nothing's more disorienting, right, than being given some code with no explanation of what it's for or what it will do. Next, show the code. And then finally, after sharing the code, explain some of its key concepts in more detail. So depending on the length of your code and its complexity, this is most likely going to involve some trade-offs. You can't possibly explain everything. But I would suggest that that's a great place to think about your understanding objectives. Um, the concepts that you want the reader to learn by the end of the tutorial should be the things that you draw out of the code um, in that moment. So here's an example of what this can look like in practice. This example is taken from a tutorial where the reader creates a Docker Compose file and adds service definitions to it. So before the code, there's an explanation of what the code will do. In this case, it's going to define a Node.js application service, and then we see the code. After the code block, and I'll spare you from looking at it in full, there's an explanation of the relevant components of the code. Um, and this example uses bullet points. In, in general, I'm a huge fan of bullet points, um, especially if you have like more than like two points to cover. Get those bullets, because um, it can really help break up those explanations. So likewise, we have a template for thinking about step introductions. Um, our procedural tutorials, as some of you may know, are organized into steps, each of which discovers a, um, covers a discrete task or a set of closely related tasks. So at the beginning of each tutorial step, we encourage the author to tell the reader what they are about to do and why they are doing it. We also have a template for thinking about transitions, both at the end of steps and in the doc itself. So at the end of sections or steps, we encourage authors to tell the reader what they have done and how it connects to what's coming next. 
in the context of the doc itself, where there are changes in context or spaces, we suggest cueing the reader with explicit callouts. The more explicit, the better. So for example, is the reader moving from GUI to command line? Are they opening another terminal window here? Do they need to save and close a file? We suggest giving the reader as much guidance as possible. OK, so we might say that templates make sense in an edit editing context. But can we also use them in our own writing? And are there other ways that maybe we can think about writing as a form of editing? So for the purpose of this discussion, I want to think about writing in two ways, both the writing that we do on our own to create the docs um, and the feedback that we give to colleagues in an informal context. So for many of us, this latter activity falls under the heading of peer review or peer edit. So my question is, how can we apply editing and teaching principles to both of these facets of our work as writers? For many of us, editing happens primarily in the context of peer review. And it may be tempting to think that we don't need to be sensitive to teaching and editing principles when working with other professional writers, right? Um, but I want to suggest that this is, this is false. One thing, for example, that can be really easily neglected when you're working with a peer, um, which would be totally explicit if you were working with an external contributor or a student, is explaining your thinking in detail. Um, why are you proposing this change? Walk your reader through the logic as if you were engaging in a teaching interaction. And to be clear, I mean, teaching in this context doesn't imply that the reviewer necessarily knows more than the reviewee. It just implies that there's a discussion about writing principles afoot that concerns both parties. Don't neglect grammar. Ah, grammar. Um, it's, <laughs> it's easy to treat it, right, like a, like a low-level topic. Um, when working, especially when working with other professional writers, we take for granted that we all know it, uh, so it usually flies under the radar as below the level of comment. We make the fix and we move on, usually without a discussion. But if you think about it, grammar is at the very core of how we organize our thoughts and ideas. And as such, it, it's pretty important. So if we bring grammatical issues to our peers in a spirit of mutual learning, um, then I would suggest we all stand to benefit. Um, I mean, I, I, I realize I could be saying this to justify being a ride or die grammar nerd, but I, I really do think that um, it's, those discussions can even be fun. Ask questions in your peer review. So key to both teaching and editing is the process of asking questions. Doing so is a way to clarify understanding for all parties involved. Asking questions in a peer review clarifies your understanding, of course, but more importantly, it gives your peer a chance to sharpen their expression. So I would suggest that it's the most important thing we do as peer reviewers um, to support our colleagues in their work. OK, so we've thought now a little bit about how peer reviews, um, are, as one facet of our writing, um, can reflect some of these teaching and editing principles. But now I want to see, like, how can we apply this stuff to the process that we undertake, those of us who work on technical documentation, the process that we undertake each day working on our docs? So what does it mean, or what could it mean to write like a teacher? First of all, I would suggest this means clarifying your why. Why does your doc exist, and who is it for? I would suggest here, too, that it's important to think about the philosophical why as well as the practical why, like do this task. Um, it's not just about doing the task, right? Your doc is also about solving a problem. Have an understanding goal. So what principles do you want your reader to fully understand by reading your doc? What problems would you like them to be able to solve on their own? How would you define a successful transfer of learning through authentic performance? 
what would authentic performance look like for your doc and the concepts that it covers? To the best of your ability, try to name your audience. What do they know? Why did they land on your doc? What did they come for? Can you accommodate as many different subject positions and experiences as possible? Let's flip it now. What might it mean to write like an editor? In the same way that you would want an external author or peer review partner to clearly state the utility and need for this document, be sure to state it in your own writing. Use templates. Got to love templates. Are there things that every author of this particular type of document should do regardless of content? You will want to do all of these things. In fact, you could make it like a genre checklist for yourself as you write. I haven't done this, but I may try because that sounds like a good idea. So one thing that I do, not quite a genre checklist, but when I write procedural articles for DigitalOcean, I try to use that three-tier intro structure that I discussed earlier. So where I define key concepts, explain the central problem or methodology that I'm covering, and then I'm going to tell the reader what we're going to build together. I always, always, always try to do those three things. Try to adopt a beginner's mind as you write, particularly as you revise. So this means approaching your material in the mindset of somebody who doesn't know it and trying to imagine what it would be like to not know this thing or that stack. If this means stepping away to do a before you do a final ed edit, I would definitely do it. When you've had some space and time, especially, you'll be able to better see the gaps in your own logic. And make sure you hold yourself accountable for those gaps in the same way that you would a student or an external contributor. OK, so we've explored some of the tasks and the functions that live within our jobs as technical writers, as well as the hybrid functions and approaches that become visible when we look at where these roles overlap. As someone with an interdisciplinary background, I find this all pretty exciting. And it sounds like I'm not the only person with an interdisciplinary background here, which is really fun. Um, so on, you know, to that point, I would argue that you could sub out editing and teaching and sub in other disciplines and practices that touch our work. Right? So we all work at the intersections between different fields. And often, we're coming to this field from very different places. This means that we can look at the facets of our work in a variety of ways based on the domains of our expertise. I want to make the case that this kind of thinking, the kind where we appreciate the deeply inter sorry, the, the kind of thinking that where we appreciate the deeply interdisciplinary na nature of our work makes us better at it. And I will just say, if anyone like uses this template and maps it in a completely different way, please like at me or something, because I, I, I would love to see like how someone else would do this. Um, yeah. Okay, so to conclude briefly, there are many ways to think about the hybrid nature of the tasks that we do as producers of technical documentation. We can think about it as we build understanding in our docs through teaching and in how we teach through editing as both editors and peer reviewers. And finally, we can think about it in the editing and teaching practices that inform us as we write through questions like, who is this doc for? Why does it need to exist? Will it empower the reader and encourage independence? By thinking in this way, we can draw on the interdisciplinarity of our work to make it better and better able to help the people that we serve. So before I go, I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, I want to thank these fine folks um, who have lent their beauteous images uh, to this talk. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers here at Write the Docs and to the mentors. Thank you, really. Um, and another thank you to the mentors and my teammates at DigitalOcean. Um, who have acted as very generous interlocutors to me as I've built out this talk. All right, folks.